Hey guys, welcome back. So today I have another uh, exploitation tutorial video for beginners. This one is aimed at the more um, advanced uses of ROP or return oriented programming. So make sure if you haven't already, uh, check out the previous videos I've done on ROP or if you're already an expert at ROP or already know a bit about it, then you should be okay with this. But there are other videos on the playlist going over the basics of it. But this video is gonna be about runtime patching using ROP. So I've, I've made videos in the past showing how to patch iOS applications and other um, binaries using a disassembler program such as Hopper or IDA Pro where you simply open it and you replace a few instructions and then you produce a new executable and then run that and it's patched. Now that's not always um, as easy um, as it seems because with certain things such as embedded systems or uh, the kernel for an operating system, for example iOS kernels, you cannot simply uh, modify them and then rerun them on the device because it actually invalidates their signature and they'll basically be rejected so your device cannot run a modified, a pre-patched kernel. So to get around this, what most user land jailbreak tools do and other um, attackers would do when trying to patch a program that they cannot modify themselves, they would actually use runtime patching uh, with ROP. So this is a way of actually patching the application as it's running using an exploit. So that's what we're basically going over in this video. We're going to be exploiting an app called ROP Level 3, which is the third um, ROP exploitation challenge I've made. Uh, you can download it below in the description uh, on my GitHub page. It's an ARMv7 macro file, so you'll need an iOS device to run it, but I'll also provide the source code if you want to build it for a different system and actually try it on something else. So we're going to start by quickly looking at ROP Level 3 and actually what it is. So let's quickly SSH into my iOS device from my Mac. You can actually do this through mobile terminal and the device itself if you prefer but for uh, viewing purposes, I'll use terminal on the Mac. And then we're gonna run dot slash ROP level three to launch the program. And you can see we get a little welcome message. Then we get a, a line of text saying internal mode is set as zero. And then we have three options in green text. So we have a uh, option one, which is just to run a function. Option two is to run an internal function. And option three is to exit the program. So option one, if we type that and enter, you can see it just uh, displays a simple text line saying hello world and then it returns us back to the menu for us to choose another option. If we attempt to run option two, the internal function, it will tell us that we don't have permission to launch this function. And then finally, if we just option three, it will just exit the program. So the idea of this video and the goal for ROP level three is to actually patch it uh, using return or into programming to allow us to always be able to run the internal function. And to do that, we need to understand a little bit about how the binary actually works. So we're gonna use IDA Pro to disassemble ROP level three. So just open it in IDA Pro and wait for it to do its thing. Then we're gonna to navigate to the main function and you can see it produces us quite a nice uh, little flow, flow chart showing us the control flow of the program and how it works. So right in the first little box there, we can see that we have a couple of calls to printf, which we'll, we'll assume will just display the welcome messages. Then we have this big loop um, underneath that, which does quite a few things. So you can see in the, the, uh, the third box down here, you can see another call to printf. Then we have a call to scanf, which is what actually waits for the user input. Also, this is the reason the program is vulnerable, that scanf is vulnerable to a buffer overflow, stack buffer overflow vulnerability. And finally, we have a call to validate, which we don't really know what that is yet, but we'll just assume that's something to do with um, validating what, user, what the user input is and then deciding what to do after that. And you can see that basically just loops around back to the top so that it keeps going on and on after you choose your option, basically allowing you to choose multiple options um, and one in one run of the program. So we're going to take a look at the validate function because that's where most of the patching we're going to do is going to be taking place. So we can just double click on the validate word from the main function. It will take us straight to the validate function. And you can see at first glance, the control flow graph for this one looks a lot more complex because there's a lot more different um, conditional branches and a lot of different uh, blocks of code. So all you really need to understand is roughly what it's doing. You don't actually need to understand every single thing and how it works completely because that's not actually going to be required to be able to patch it. So all this function is responsible for doing is identifying which number the user enters on the menu. So whether it's one, two, three or an invalid number and then performing a certain action dependent on that number. So you can see there's several calls to string compare throughout this function and that's used to compare the number with whatever they're checking for. So if the user enters number one, then you can see this big arrow goes straight down and it will it will just call the function, the user function that you're allowed to run. It will run that function and then return back to the main menu. 
But if the user enters number two, it gets a little bit more complex because this is an internal function. So the program first checks to see whether you're running an internal mode. And if you're not, it will not allow you to run the function. So you can see this string compare here. It will compare it against the value of the variable internal mode which we know is set to zero as we saw when we run the program. And since it is set to zero, it means you're not running in internal mode. Therefore, you will get a message saying you do not have permission to run the function. But if it's set to anything other than zero, then it will go to this green path here and it will, it will basically just call the internal function. So from that, we basically already know how to patch it. You don't actually need to care about any of the other fun uh, any else, anything else about this function, how it works. All we need to know is that we need this internal mode variable to be set to something other than zero. It, it can be anything you want. As long as it's not zero, you will always be allowed to call this function. Now, there's a lot more advanced ways you could probably patch this with actually changing the instructions themselves, but you really don't need to. This is a very simple patch. All you need to do is patch the value of this variable, and you'll always be able to run the internal function. So obviously, if you were going to unpatch this binary statically, then you can just simply replace the value of that variable and then re-export it and run it on the device and it'd be patched. Now to do that with um, an exploit and actually using ROP, it's a little bit more complex because first of all, you obviously need a vulnerability and then you need to learn how you can use ROP to actually modify the memory of the program as it's running. So we've already identified the vulnerability of the program, as I said earlier, with scanf. Scanf basically has a classic stack buffer overflow vulnerability where it does not have any bounds checking. So you can enter a really large input and it's going to try and store it into the buffer, whatever size it is. So we'll just quickly check that this is vulnerable. We'll just run the program in GDB. And as one of our inputs, instead of using one, two, or three as the actual option menu keys, we can just type in a patterned input with the alphabet. And you can see the program crashes there with an invalid address at 4646 4646, which is the hex equivalent of FFFF. So that means we know the offset right away for the return address. So we're just going to keep that in mind and now we can actually get on to crafting the exploit string. So to be able to actually write a patch using ROP, we need a way to be able to write our own data into our own memory location, meaning we need to be able to control both things, the memory location we're writing to and the data we want to write to it. And to do that, we can use a special type of ROP gadget known as a write gadget or a write anywhere gadget. Now these are actually used um, in jailbreaks and in anything where you want to apply a patch to a running process because it will allow you to just overwrite currently um, stored addresses or currently stored memory at certain addresses. So, for example, here's an example of a write gadget that was used in Evasion 7 or in Evasion 6, actually, the untethered jailbreak for iOS 6.1, I believe. This gadget is a very simple gadget. It's just str r0, r0, r1. And this gadget, basically, the str instruction in ARM stores a value. And you can see there, if we put a value inside of R0, it will store the value of R0 into the memory location pointed to by R1. So for example of that, if we have a very small function here with uh, four instructions, you can see the last instruction there, we have a branch not equal to ABCD. Now, what we want to do is change that so that it um, branch equals to that. So we could use this gadget. You can see there, if we have the gadget on the side, if inside of R0, we place the hex bytes equivalent of branch equal ABCD, which is our patched instruction we want to write. And then inside R1, we put the address of the current instruction being 0x04, so hex, hex 4. Uh, when, this instruct, when this gadget is actually executed, what it's going to do is it's going to look at this address and it's going to write whatever we put into R1, oh sorry, R0, into the address pointed to by R1, meaning that we will basically replace the currently stored instruction at hex 4 with whatever instruction we put there, meaning we can basically just rep replace instructions and um, apply patches that way. So that's basically how runtime patching works with ROP using these gadgets. So after that's done, the patch is applied and it will stay it will stay patched through that whole runtime of the program, although it's not actually modifying the binary itself. So when you restart it, the patch will be gone. Now replacing instructions like that is actually easier said than done because uh, the text section, which is where the instructions are actually stored, this is marked as uh, executable but non-writable, meaning you cannot actually write anything to it. So uh, even if you did have this gadget and you actually set it up correctly, you would get a fail, you get an error, you, your program basically crash if you try to overwrite any kind of instructions there, meaning that you can't actually do this um, without modifying the kernel itself. So this is using kernel exploits, but it's not really practical for doing it when exploiting these simple user land challenges such as ROP level 3. Although we can use an alternate way, we can uh, actually replace data in the data section, which is marked as writable. 
So this is where all the variables are stored. So for the internal mode variable, this is perfect because this is stored in a data section, meaning we can actually write to it, meaning we can replace it with whatever we want. So this exact write gadget has actually been planted into ROP level 3 to make it easier for you guys to exploit it. I've actually put it in a function called write gadget, so you can just search for this function inside of IDA and you will find this gadget. Um, you also obviously need to be able to control the two registers because it will store the value of one register into the memory location pointed by the other register. If you don't control these registers, then it's pointless because it's not going to be doing what you want. So there's actually another gadget as well inside a function just named gadget. And this one will allow you to set up these registers before you use the right uh, gadget. Meaning you can place your values in the registers and then call the right gadget uh, the right gadget function. And it will basically overwrite whatever you've set it up to do. So both of these gadgets, as I said, are planted there. If you were doing this in a real world situation, you have to actually search for them. And they may have side effects in real world situations. It might not be as simple as that. But for this one, it is. So we just need to uh, open up a text edit and we're going to note down a few important addresses which are going to help us be able to write this exploit. So first of all, the right gadget, we're just going to put the address of the right gadget um, instruction that we want. Underneath that, we're going to do the address of the regular gadget, which will allow us to set up the registers. And then we're going to have the address of the internal mode variable in the data section. This is so that we know where to overwrite the data to. And then we're actually going to need the address of the start of main. Now you'll see why that is later on, but don't worry about that right now. So once you've got all these values written down, then you're ready to actually go ahead and write the exploit. So it's just going to be a simple exploit string, just like the previous tutorials. And the structure of it will be basically like this. So we're going to have our junk characters, first of all, which we know it needs to go up to F in the alphabet. And then we're going to have the address of the gadget. Now, this is the regular gadget, the one that's going to set up the registers. When this function is called, or when this gadget is executed, it's basically going to pop off the next two values on the stack, or the next three values in the stack, actually, into the registers R0, R1, and PC. So we need to set this up so that we can use it later. So first of all, after the in, uh, inside of the R1 register, we want the new value for the internal mode. So currently, the internal mode is set to 0. We know that we need to have it to anything other than 0. So you can actually put anything you want here. So I'm just going to put 1111. And then after that, we need the address of internal mode. So the actual address in the data section of the internal mode variable. And then after that, we need the next address. This is where the program will jump to next because this one's going into the program counter. So you want the right anywhere gadget address here. And then after that, we're going to need four characters of junk. So we're just going to have AAA and then the start of main. Now, this part is actually um, nothing to do with the patch, really. But this is to actually allow us to use the patch once it's been applied. Because if you just do this, if you run this exploit string without this extra bit at the end, then the program will actually apply the patch correctly, but it will just crash meaning you have to restart it and it basically won't work. So you can't actually use the patch. Um, what this does at the end, uh, with the junk characters in the main, is it basically will jump back to the start of main after the patch has been applied. So what it's basically doing is restarting the program with the patch applied so you can actually use it. So we're going to type this out um, in terminal. Just obviously remember to use printf so that we can actually enter hex characters and use backslash x to actually enter a hex character. And remember that do them in little endian, so in byte reverse order. So once you've written this out in terminal, you want to do a space and then use the straight line character followed by um, running the actual program, ROP level 3. And this will basically pipe the input into ROP level 3, meaning it will enter our exploit string into the program and exploit it. So you can see if we run that, I actually got a segmentation fault because I put the two gadgets around the wrong way. So make sure that you actually have them in the right order. The regular gadget needs to be first. The right gadget comes second. So I'm just quickly going to replace these two gadgets, rewrite the string. And now when we run it, you can see that it actually works, but we get this really unusual activity. You can see that the program basically keeps restarting constantly and it goes really, really fast. You cannot really stop it unless you actually just kill the process. Um, meaning you can't actually enter anything, so you can't even use the secret function, even though the patch has actually been applied. Now the reason for this is because when piping in an input, it's going to it's going to be constantly piping it in until the program no longer waits for input. Now ROP level three is constantly waiting for an input, so this basically doesn't work. Now what we can do to fix this is actually use a command known as cat. Now this command is used to um, view the contents of files, but if you just run cat without any argument, without any file name you can see what happens. It basically just waits for you to enter something. And then when you enter something, it'll just basically uh, displace it back on the screen. And this goes on forever until you kill the process. So we can use this to our advantage. What we can do is actually 
uh, inside of brackets, we can run first of all our exploit string, but then we can use um, a colon and then run cat and then close the brackets. Now what this is going to do is it's going to run the exploit string, but then instantly run cat afterwards, causing the program to basically wait for our input, meaning that we won't have this endless loop. So just use this and then we want to pipe that back into ROP level 3 the same way as before. And you can see what happens now is that it actually doesn't keep looping. It stops and it waits for our input just like it should. And then what we need to do is just enter one more time. And you can see the program will restart itself and you'll have the internal mode variable set as 1111, which is what we entered in our exploit string. So the patch was successfully applied and the exploit worked. So now what you can do is simply type option number two to run the secret or the internal function. And you can see this time you don't get any kind of permission denied error. The function runs as it normally should and it gives you three additional options. One of these being to spawn a shell and you can just type two again to spawn the shell. And you can see there you go, you have a root shell allowing you to run any kind of command you want on the system and get your way around it. So that's basically the uh, fundamentals of how runtime patching works with ROP. Now with iOS jailbreaks, obviously they do also patch instructions as well, which involves actually modifying the page tables to allow um, uh, the text section to be writable and stuff like that. But this can be used as well because there are certain variables that also need patching with jailbreaks, such as CS enforcement disable. If you patch this variable in the same way we've done in this video, you actually get um, the ability to run any kind of app, whether it's signed or not. Um, but that's just the fundamentals of how it works. Obviously, this is not only used with iOS jailbreaks, it's just this, this channel is based around iOS, so I'll always link it into that. But this is used for any kind of attack, any kind of um, situation where you'd want to patch out a security feature from a process, uh, this can be used. So, hope you guys enjoyed this video. The download links for ROP Level 3 will be in the description if you want to try it out yourselves. If you have any questions or requests for future videos, then leave a comment or talk to me on Twitter at BLS1000, and I will try to reply to them. So, yeah, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe for more and I will see you next time.